Hey, church, it's good to see you. Come on, let's stand up in God's presence. Doesn't feel good in here, huh? Yes. He led me out of the desert, brought me into the streams, river of living water. It turned my bed into sweet. All my burdens lifted, took the shackles off my
those chains. Let go of those chains. When we raise dead. Come on, tell it today. That grave come out. Come on, new things are coming to life today. Captives, let go of those chains. Let go of those chains. When we
I just feel like this morning God's asking us to lay down our weapons, stop fighting our own battles. David gives us this beautiful word picture in Psalm 23. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And it's this picture of our enemies bound and tied up and defeated and us sitting down at the table of fellowship with our God. So could we sing this again? And as we do that, could you just, could you lay down the battle that you're fighting, the war that you're waging, trying to win it in your strength? And could you say, God, I trust you. I trust you that you've defeated my enemy. I trust you that you've gone before me. I trust you that you're working on my behalf. And church, some of you might have to do that in faith this morning because you don't see the end of the battle. But would you worship out of faith? Would you worship out of trust in our God who is victorious? morning, God. 
I ask for your blessing on this body. I ask for your grace on us to go be a light in the dark places of this world. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Amen, let's give God a hand. What a good time in his presence. Hey, go ahead and say hi to someone around you and you can go ahead and take a seat. Well, welcome to City Church Rockford. We are so happy to have you here with us today. I also want to welcome those of you who are watching online. We are so glad you decided to join us. If you are interested in getting connected with this church, it's a really easy thing to do. And we want to connect with you because we believe that the body of Christ is exactly that. It's a body. And it requires all the members and the parts to work together and serve and offer their gifts and their talents. And so if that's something that you're interested in, all you got to do is grab that little connect card from the seat pocket in front of you. If you're watching online, there's a part of our website you can go to where you can fill out the connect form. Um, but just do that. Reach out to us and we'll reach out back to you and we'll kind of get you connected, answer any questions you might have and get you more involved in this church. Well, we are going to continue to worship this morning with our giving. And I just want to encourage you all. Um, I got to be a part of something this weekend that was really cool. Our city youth have been at camp since Thursday. They're coming back today. And we are, yes, it's been an awesome weekend for them. We are trusting that God moved and worked in their hearts while they were gone. Um, but I was up there just for a couple hours on Thursday night. And I got to see something very cool. I got to see giving um, in a different way than what we normally talk about, you know, financially investing in the kingdom of God. But there's about 20 leaders up there who invested their weekend and their time and their hearts into these youth. Yes. Give them a hand. Um, I don't know if I have the grace for that right now. <laughs> I used the youth ministry for many years, but um, they just... They are pouring into the future of the church, um, and they're pouring into the future pastors and the future worship leaders that are going to be in front of us in the next 10 years. And so um, what a cool way to invest into the kingdom of God. And I also know many of you gave toward those students going to camp. There were scholarships for kids who couldn't afford it. So I just want to thank you, the body of Christ, um, for investing in this upcoming generation because it's, it's a powerful thing, and we better do it because they're coming up fast and they're coming up on fire for Jesus, and I'm so excited for that. So let's pray over this offering. God, we just thank you. Um, we thank you for everything we have, God. And we just wanna, we wanna give to you, God, and we wanna ask that as we give, God, you would just release our hearts from any kind of materialism, God, from any kind of love of money, God, and that you would just set us free, God, um, to use our resources for the kingdom. God, would you take what is given and would you bless it? Would you increase it? Would you use it to reach people who need to hear about Jesus? Would you use it to reach people who are in need and who are hurting? God, we trust you with this offering. We trust you to use it in ways that only you can do. In your precious name we pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us here and online at City Church Rockford. On Thursday, August 20th, we'll be hosting a big giveaway event right here in the City Church Rockford parking lot from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. This event is designed to bless people in our community with items that they may need but might not have the means to get for themselves in this current environment. So please plan to join us and be sure to invite anyone you know who might benefit. Besides the giveaway items, we'll have a cookout, prize drawings every hour, a craft for the kids, and prayer. Everyone is invited to attend. Hi, I'm Lori Badge, and I'm so excited to be leading the charge in our children's ministry. I can't wait to share the new vision for City Kids with you. We've been busy reconnecting with past volunteers as we get ready to relaunch City Kids on Sunday mornings, but we need more volunteers like you. Whether you want to rock a baby, tell a Bible story to a toddler, or interact in small groups with kindergarten through fifth graders, there's a place for you. No experience is necessary. 
I know that it's so important that our volunteers feel comfortable and equipped to serve. So on Monday, August 17th at 7 p.m., we'll have a volunteer kickoff meeting here at City Church. We'll meet in the loft for a time of relationship building, training, snacks, and fun. You'll also meet a fantastic team that you can be part of, and you'll walk away feeling equipped and ready to go. If God is tugging on your heart to get involved, please come. If you're curious but maybe not sure, please come. If you're a college student, a grandparent, or somewhere in between, please come. All are welcome. More information is available on the church website or at the Welcome Center. I hope to see you there. On August 16th, we'll launch 40 Days of Prayer and Fasting. During this time, we'll focus on both personal and corporate repentance, reconciliation, restoration, and revival. We will ask the Lord to move powerfully in us, in the church, and in the nation. We are asking that each one of you choose and commit to fasting and praying for at least one day between August 16th and September 25th. We're calling it the Power of One, and our vision for this time is for it to be a relay race. Each seemingly standalone day of prayer and fasting will be linked to the next and the next until together we have completed 40 full days of continuous prayer and fasting. You can choose your day or days online at the church website. If you have any questions or anything we can help with, please stop at a Welcome Center, visit our website, or call the church. Well, good morning, City Church. It is good to be with you today. Uh, my name is Dan, and I have the privilege of being part of the teaching team here. And today I have a message that I've been working on a lot this weekend. I have been spending a lot of time preaching this message while I'm riding my bicycle, getting in the car, preaching this message, standing by the water, preaching. I've preached this message already a bunch of times. So today I'm going to simp uh, simply try to communicate to you what the Lord started laying on my heart a couple months ago from a scripture verse that came to me, and I'll share that with you later. But I'm just asking you to come with an open heart. As I always say when I preach, I'm just praying that the Lord will use my words to draw you closer to Him. It's a very simple message, but it will give you great hope. If we finish this message and you don't have some hope, then I missed my whole point. So as I start, I want you just to open your heart to, to hope. I was talking with a pastor friend of mine, actually, I was listening to him talk a little bit last week, and he was reading, he's been reading over the last few weeks, uh, quotes of people at the end of their life. So famous people who we've all heard of and known of, last things they said, things they said on their deathbed, just those type of comments. And as he was sharing about one particular individual, it really caught my ear and then I spent a lot of time looking into the last days of this person. They passed away in 2006. And I spent a lot of time just, just thinking about their last days. Because this person that I'm going to talk to you about has influenced you more than you know. Um, you drive where you drive these days uh, using a tool this person gave you. You uh, talk to your teens uh, in a different way than you would have talked to them 20 years ago because of this device. And it's a device you're carrying, many of you in your pocket right now, it's this. It's called an iPhone. A guy named Steve Jobs invented it. I still remember the day that he was standing, I believe it was in California in front of a large audience, and he said, well, I've come up with something new. And he held up this phone and everybody cheered and he said, I've been wondering what in the world I could do to, to like give you something you could use to tell it what to do. And he was holding his finger up and then of course he swiped it and everybody went crazy and now we all swipe like crazy. Even those that have a two-year-old, they know how to just do this and pull it down. Your grandma and grandpa ain't got no clue, but that two-year-old, they know how to work it. This little device has changed your life. You're on it a lot. You talk to your kids. I mean, they're in the basement. You used to go, hey! Now you just go, hey, come up here. I mean, you just text them <laughs> in your own house. It's changed your life. And that gentleman, Steve Jobs, who invented this, um, he didn't know God at all in his life. He was not a believer in Jesus. And so the end of his life was different. In fact, one of the quotes that he shared near the very end of his life was, the greatest invention of life 
is death. And he said, because you can't stop it. You can't trade places. You can't pay someone to go into your spot. You can't do anything. It's, it's coming. In fact, his last words, and I'm not going to speculate. I'm not going to go as far as to say, I know what he was thinking. I don't. But I know he was godless, and I know he did not believe in Jesus. In his last words, he looked at his family. This is all over. You can read it and study it. There's been a book written about it. He looked past his family. He looked right at their faces, and he looked past them, and he said these words, Oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. And he died. And as I've thought about his life, all he accomplished, how it affects you already this morning, it reminds me that everything in this world you can attain because he attained it will leave you in the end hopeless and with a feeling of void in your life. And I believe that right now in our society as I look at it, in fact, I sat down the other day with a really wealthy individual, not to Steve Jobs level, but really, really close. The difference is this gentleman loves Jesus with all of his heart and he is incredibly wealthy. And I said to him, because we were talking about the, our society right now, how people, without realizing it, they're looking for something to fill a void. They're looking for something to save them. In fact, I wrote it down like this. People are looking to be saved. Saved right now from COVID. Because that's the threat. But people want saving in general. Many don't even see it. They don't even know it. They don't even understand it. But what they need to see is the hope for that salvation is only found in Jesus. And see, our world doesn't have that. I want to I just get you to play along with me for a second. Let's say you don't believe that God created this earth. Let's say you don't believe he has the hope for us. Let's say you don't believe any of that. All you know is what you've been able to create and all that you've been able to accomplish. If this is it, let me tell you, if you're really wealthy, you have inside you, if you're really influential, you have inside you, I gotta save the world. But if you don't believe there's a God, you've got to step in and save the world. That's why the kings back in the, why'd they go to the kings back in the pre our time? Because those kings save us. And as people, our world right now is looking for somebody to save them, save them with a mask, save them with a politician. Save them with something that will come along that will give them relief from this or that or the other. Because we want saving. And I said to this really wealthy individual, sitting across the table from him two weeks ago, maybe a week ago. I can't remember. We were out to lunch. And I said to him, so right now, you're very powerful. You have lots of influence. People listen to you. I said, if you, I know you believe in God and Jesus and everything else. But if you didn't. Would you feel, I said, with all you have and all you know and all the money you've attained, is there something inside you, if there was no God, that you'd feel like you need to save this world? And he pondered a moment and he said, I would. And that's what's going on in our society. The world turns to the rich and the famous to say, save us. Hollywood, save me. And they can't. Because the best they can offer in the end will be void. And today, I want to tell you what happened with me. About a month and a half, two months ago, I was trying to think this morning. It might have been a month. I'm not sure. But this scripture, I was sitting in my office by myself. And I just felt the Lord direct me to go to this passage where he talked a lot in John. And just read a verse that I've preached from. In fact, when I say it, all y'all who are part of church are going to go, yep, I know that verse. But something happened to me that day. I read the verse, and I felt like the Lord just laid on my spirit, read it again, and I read it again. Read it again, and I kept reading it over and over. It's a very short verse, and I kept reading. Okay, Lord, I'm reading it. Look at it. Think about it. Because you see, when Jesus spoke, there was the first and obvious meaning but I think when Jesus spoke, as we know, when he taught, sometimes his own disciples would look and go, what are you saying? 
Like he'd say something, they'd go, that's really good. What does it mean? He was really good at that. And when Jesus made this statement, when I tell you the verse, it's going to come up on the screen in just a second. When it comes up, you're going, yep, I know it. You know the first and obvious meaning I want to propose to you today as I sat in my office that day, the Lord showed me there's so many deeper meanings to this verse that you never even thought about. It's John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, what have us preachers done our whole life? Hey, there's no other way to Jesus and heaven than through the life of Christ. No other way. You can't get this way, that way, the other. All other religions, it is faith in Jesus. We've preached that our whole life. Love it. It's true. I believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father. Watch this. As I sat there that day and kept reading it, Here's what the Lord laid on my heart. I'm going to share it with you this morning. I'm going to break down the way, the truth, the life. The Lord just started laying on my heart. Read that verse for what it means in 2020 for the world right now. Watch this. Jesus said, I believe in this verse, I am the way through a pandemic. I am the way to give you guidance on whether or not you're going to send your kids to school in the fall. I am the way to know how to handle any circumstance that comes up for you right now. You're, this is unknown territory for me. Not for me, because I'm walking in the way that Jesus would walk. It's a whole new way of seeing that verse. Jesus said, I am the way for your life to take patterns and steps day by day. Because right now in our world, let me tell you, people are looking for a way. And let me, let me tell you what you do. <laughs> you post online what you're planning on doing. And then you go, boy, I probably shouldn't have posted that. Because you got people on this side, you're amazing. You're awesome. People over here, you're the biggest idiot I've ever met. <laughs> because people, people don't know the way. They know their way. And they'll figure out how to get information that sides with them so that your thought looks kind of messed up. Or you go and just hang out with people who think like you so that you can go, see, I'm right, I'm right. And the whole time Jesus is saying, you guys really think you know the way? How's that worked out for the greatest you've ever had among you? Did creating the greatest invention, I believe, of our time find the way? No, it, it'll find the way. First time I came to City Church in Rockford, I went, tap, took me right to it. Now I know where to go. Today, as soon as I leave here, if I go somewhere, tap, take me right to it. That's amazing. I can't go, tap, take me to heaven, won't do it. Because this world doesn't show me that way. And today, I want to show you that Jesus said, I am the way for you to make a decision that you can be at peace with in your life. And if you follow me fully, I'll guide every step. Let me just kind of give you an illustration of it. Now, as soon as I say this, some of you are going to like me or not like me. Because anytime you say anything about masks, you either have people go, oh, you're awesome. Or that's stupid. <laughs> I was thinking the other day. Let's just take the group sitting in this room. Don't even have to go out. Don't even calculate in the world at all. Let's take the people sitting in this room. If all the time... In the last six months that we have spent talking about masks, if collectively in this room, that amount of time had spent in prayer. Jesus said, I am the way. Your discussions sometimes are not the way. I had a situation happen to me. Um, it was either there, earlier this week or late last week. Um, I had gone to Speedway. I go to Speedway a lot to get my coffee. They got these new automatic roasters. I mean, it's awesome. So I go in there. I push. I, you know, I go in there, push my button, get my morning coffee, and go through my day. It's just I just, I just do that. It's my, kind of my routine. And I drove from my house and I got to Speedway and I pulled in and I got out of my car and I walked over the door and I realized <clears throat> forgot my mask. 
you know, it's kind of a rule and guideline in our society right now, and it's not anti the Bible. I've heard people say, that mask is demonic. No, it's not. It's a mask. It's not. It's not. It's not of Satan. It's a mask. And our governors ask us to wear it. And whether you agree with that or not, to me, it's simple. Go, okay, that's what she's asked of us. It's not, if you ask me to cross the line that's not of the Lord's teaching, then that's one thing. But a mask is a mask. So I wear it. And I wear it because I'm honoring the rule and the guideline. And there are people who are affected greatly by COVID, more than probably me. I've been around a lot of people. And so far, by God's grace, I haven't had COVID. But I'm just telling you. I don't worry as much as others, but I also try to take into consideration what other people feel. So I walked up to the speedway door and I went, shoot, I forgot my mask. So I opened the door and there was a worker there. I did not know at the time that the worker was the actual manager of speedway. So I opened the door. I said, sir, can I ask you a question? I said, I just left my house and I want to get some coffee here. I love your coffee. And I, I left my mask at home. Do, do you have a mask I could purchase real quick before I even come in? And, and just so, it, so it's peaceful and everybody will be good. And he looked at me. He said, oh, I'm good. He said, you, you checked with me. I'm the manager of the store. That's when he told me. I'm the manager of the store. So come on in. You'll be fine. Just grab. You're getting co-. I said, coffee. He said, yeah, just grab it. Pay. You'll leave. You'll be okay. And, and I stepped inside the door and I looked and there were two or three people in the store besides me, besides the lady up at the counter. And I saw them and I said, sir, sorry, but the, everybody else in the store has mask on. And some of them might, it might be more susceptible to COVID than me. And I don't need it for me, but I'd like to maybe wear one for them. So can we at least check and see if you have one? And the dude, the manager, he stopped all the stuff he's working on. He goes, what did you just say? I said, well, I want to be sensitive to what they might feel because I may feel one way, but they may feel another. And I just want, I want to show kindness to them. The manager of the store said to me, sir, in all my time of dealing with all this, that's the kindest thing that anyone has said from the beginning of this time. Now, let me, let me quickly tell you that I'm not always kind. I had a softball game on Wednesday night and that ump was wrong. So, you know, I got that one over there to deal with too. But I'll go back to the good one a second. (laughs) So I said to him, well, I I just want to be a little careful because, you know, I mean, I don't know what they feel about it. I'm fine, but I wanted to be sensitive to what they thought. He He could not believe it. He could not believe it. And I left the speedway driving away. Watch this. I drove away and I thought, I didn't know that guy. Never seen him before. I don't remember his name right now. But if he ever shows up somewhere where I preach, he doesn't know I was a preacher. If he ever shows up somewhere where I preach, I think he'll listen. That umpire, not so sure. <laughs> but I think he'll listen. And I thought to myself, Dan, you did that the right way. Can, can I say something to y'all about Jesus? Jesus. He went out of his way to be kind to people. And he didn't start with, you need to accept me. Then we have a conversation. The woman at the well did not know who he was. She just said, why are you being so kind to me? You're not supposed to, why, why do you keep insisting on helping me? He's like, because it's who I am. Kindness just exudes out of me. Let me just ask y'all, since, since we call ourselves followers of Jesus, is kindness exuding out of you during this pandemic? Do people just go, man, why are you so kind all the time? Or are you, going, are you one of those that goes over there and your opinion about masks, you make sure everybody knows it and I got a poster to prove it. Because <laughs> I think Jesus would say, really? I'm the way for you to get through this and to honor me fully. This is a different kind of proposal to you today to see and to understand that Jesus is the way. As I got to this part and I stood where I preached the message this weekend or I was in my car or I was on my bicycle, I rode my bike and preached this message. I got to this place and I got to tell you, this is a moment in the message that I want to be very succinct and say to some of you, And some of you, especially online, maybe you're sitting in a Speedway parking lot, just got your coffee, and you're sitting there watching me on your iPhone that Steve Jobs made. (laughs) When I invite you to ask Jesus to be the way in your life, for some of you, it's actually a turn-off sentence because of some preacher, 
some person who shoved Jesus down your stinking throat. I talked to a guy this week. I'd never met him before. It happened actually yesterday. Met him on a golf course. He had never he found out I was a preacher. And before that, he was F-bombs, everything else. As soon as he found out I was a preacher, he stopped all that. And I said, dude, you, you don't have to change because of me. You be who you are, and I'll be who I am. At the end of the 18 holes, he said to me, where do you ever preach, man? I want to hear you sometime. And I said, he, and he said to me, because I got turned off by church and I want nothing to do with it. But you, made me, you make me at least want to go check it out again. That's what Jesus did. See, the religious leaders had turned everybody off. The Pharisees, nobody wanted anything to do with it. And Jesus said, well, will you give me a try? I don't do it that way. I do it with kindness. I don't do it with sticking it down your throat. And today I want to show you something. I'm going to invite you to do something. Those of you online as well. I have this little glass here, and, and I, I'm going to tell you that the world, the best it offers, the Steve Jobs of this world, it, his glass was full of the world, but it was still empty. And I want to invite you today. I want to ask you a question. As you look at your life, if this, this glass is your life, is your glass, are you peaceful? Like, are you peaceful? I know a lady right now, I'm, I'm watching her at a distance. She doesn't have Jesus in her life. And this COVID thing, honestly, I've never seen anybody so fearful. In she worries about everything. She worries about her kids getting it. She worries about this. It, it's fair. All of her worries are, are, are real. They're real things. But she has no hope other than her mask and distancing. And I just want to say to her, at the end of the day, the mask and the dent, distance and because because post this pandemic there's something else coming and i want peace for all of them not just one and i want to propose to you today that you consider that you consider saying jesus i, I want you to guide me in a different way now watch this as pastors we always talk about fill your glass up with jesus i want to i want to throw out a different message to the day today all i'm asking you to do is start with a little splash of jesus because i'm going to tell you this I'm going to show you why I believe this. Um, I think that's about as much of Jesus as we know and understand how to get today. I'm, I'm 60 years old this year. Can I tell you, I've probably, over the course of my last 40 years of walking with the Lord, I think I'm probably getting, I, shoot, that's probably too much. I'm probably about that full. You ask that ump, he'd say, I'm about that full. <laughs> that's 40 years of pouring Jesus into my life, and I think I understand it about that much. I want him to fill my life, but there's still a whole lot of Dan in there. <laughs> so today, if, if you're here and you say, I want, I want to try Jesus. I'm not peaceful. I, I want to give this a try. Don't think you're going to walk out of here and everything be all perfect and you do everything all right. It's just, it's not reality. That process, we don't use this word much anymore. We call it sanctification. To be fully pure before the Lord. I believe it's a process. This was me when I asked the Lord into my life when I was around, you know, 15, 16. This is me at 60. I hope it will progress at my death. Hopefully I can get more of this in there. Because his supply, he's the one that said to the woman at the well, if you taste me, I, I'm literally the living water. If you drink from me, you'll never be thirsty again. To which people went, what? I get it. What he's saying is the pandemic's all the things coming at you in life, I got you. You'll be okay because I am the way. And if you say here today, but Dan, I don't, I don't get that. I, I don't know what I would do next. Listen to this verse from Isaiah. It's just for you. If you go, I don't know. I, I want to take that step, but I don't understand. I don't even know what I'm doing when I take the step. Listen, listen, this is what God's word says. I will lead the blind, that's you, and you're pouring Jesus into your life. I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. In other words, there's new thoughts and ideas and inspiration going to come into your life that I can't even tell you about. you got to go experience it. And when one happens, you're going to go, oh, that's it. And then a little more water gets in your glass. I will guide them along unfamiliar paths. I will turn the darkness in their life into light. That's what some of us need today. Again, the world is looking for a Savior. I propose to you today, he's here. It's Jesus. And maybe today you need a fresh splash.
because he will guide you. I'll tell you this. That wasn't Dan Seaborn standing there talking to the manager at Speedway. It was Jesus working through me. Because Dan Seaborn would go, I don't care what those people need. I'm going to get my coffee. <laughs> but Dan Seaborn plus Jesus says, I want to be sensitive to what others feel too. That was Jesus. I am the way. Secondly, his word said, I am the truth. Have you ever seen a time where it's harder than right now to find the truth? Pick a topic. Go find the truth out about it. And somebody will tell me, where'd you get that? What source are you pulling that from? So all we want to do is fight and argue about it. I call it the 5,000 member foot view. 30,000 feet, Jesus said, I'm the truth. Jane posted something online, just posted something online a while back, maybe a week, a week and a half ago. Man, oh man, you know that's not true. You know that is true. You're the dumbest thing in the world. You're wonderful. And you know what it was? Truth these days is kind of like what you think it is. And then you'll find people decide with you, go, that's the truth. And I want to say to you, I think the truth is something that we go to the Lord and we say, Lord, empty me of myself. Like, help me see what you want to know here as factual and godly. You say, Dan, how does that work? How do we get all the statistics? I don't know. I don't know. I have a doctor friend in Detroit who at the beginning of COVID was dealing with literal body bags. For four nights in a row, he called me and said, Dan, I don't know what we're going to do. People were dying, hospital completely full, dying by the droves. And he said to me, Dan, if it gets to West Michigan, I fear for you. I mean, he, he's a godly man. He's level-headed. He's not a freaker outer. And he was just saying, we need to pray. It was real. That same doctor, when we talk now, we'll text or whatever, and he'll sometimes say, I'm not sure. I've got the best information I can give you, but I'm not dead sure it's all factual. So hard, even for the ones in the field to know the truth. So today I propose to you something that I know is absolute truth. You ready? Here they are, three of them coming up on the screen. Here's some truth. Number one, Jesus would not have operated out of fear. He would have been wise. He would have been sensitive. He would have been kind. He would have been caring. It's just who he was, but he would not have done all that he did in fear. Let me tell you that Satan is the author of chaos and fear. Right now, when I go to any media source, you pick it, I don't care what it is, there's a sense of fear that it gives you. Let me tell you why. If you're really peaceful, you don't even care about the news. But see, they know, I gotta get them back. If we scare them enough, they'll come back and watch it later. Because they wanna see what happened with that story. That's why they always end the story with, hey, and come back in the next few minutes, we'll tell you why there is hope for the earth, for the rest of your world. Oh, I gotta stay, get me a coffee and get back in here. <laughs> and you get back and you go, well, that wasn't that much hope. And I wanna just propose to you that Jesus doesn't operate out of fear. He never did. Go read all of his life, even in the hardest moments. He was about to be crucified. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I'll tell you what I would have been wanting to do. I mean, run. Run. I've got one more day on the earth. And Jesus said, it's over. But I'm not going to do this with fear. He sweat drops of blood, which means the anxiety on him and what he knew was coming was going to be incredibly painful. And he took it. He didn't run. Secondly, I can tell you the truth just by looking at the story of Jesus. Jesus did this. He would not have avoided seeing, loving, and helping people. Some of you in here were born to be isolationists. I have one kid of my four kids. He loved just to be alone. He said, I drill the rest of my life alone. He just loves it. When he was a teen, even growing up, we said, where's Alan at? And he's down in the basement. He loves being alone. But most of us aren't made that way. We are built for connection, communication, etc. This whole pandemic has pushed us into isolation. Can I just ask you, when you're isolated, is that a good place for Satan to get you discouraged and depressed? And Jesus comes to that place. I talk to my children about, go listen for God's guidance in that spot. You, when you are by yourself alone, you're not alone. Jesus is there with you. Jesus is not leaving you today. You say, 
well, Dan, you know, like take that situation at Speedway. What would Jesus have done? <laughs> He's got a real up on me. He would have walked in the room and said, uh, you're asymptomatic. You don't know it. Healed. Uh, you, I mean, he would have just been able to heal, 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 heal. I can't do that. I mean, I could do it, but then they'd put me in a hospital in a mental place. But I mean, you know, if I said that, they'd be like, okay, he's warped out, grab him. You know, I mean, that's just the way it is. But look right now in your own life for a place you can still in some way and somehow help others. Help others. Others who don't look like you. Right now in our society, racial issue is massive. And I'm looking at a largely white audience. Reach across the divide. Show kindness. Show love. Touch people. Help people. Listen to people. I don't agree with them. Do you think Jesus agreed with everything that came out of all the people's mouths? He sat there with the woman at the well the whole time she was talking to him. Everything she was saying, he knew. And she ain't telling me the whole thing. But he just let her talk. You remember when she walked away, what she said? She went back to her town and she said, I met a man who you can't believe. Let people walk away from you going, I can't believe it. They really do love. That's you. Put your focus on that right now. That's what Jesus would do. This is where he would go. And third, Jesus would have peace no matter what. I'm going to say something to you today that you got to know it's because my glass is this full. I could not have said this and I would not have understood it. If you're here today or you haven't accepted Jesus, the statement I want to make reflects more of a glass that I hope is getting closer to half full. And it's a pretty bold statement I want to say to you today. I am not trying to get it. I am being wise and I'm trying to protect myself. But I want all y'all to know that if you get the news that Dan Seaborn did somehow get COVID and he did pass away, I want to go ahead and tell y'all right now, I'm peaceful. I don't want that to happen. I'm not going to try to make it happen. But if it does happen, I'm peaceful. And I will be with my Savior. And it will be okay. And I couldn't have said that when I was in my 20s. I remember thinking when I was in my 20s because I didn't have a very good relationship with my father. I've told that with you, and it was a difficult life, and I felt very insecure. And I remember thinking, if my mom dies, I remember when I was a teenager going, if something happens to mom, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I remember as I got old going, wow, I'll never be able to live without my mom. When my mom did pass away, I was very peaceful because I had matured to that place. I was deeper in my walk with the Lord, and I was like, it's okay. It's my turn now. I got kids and grandkids watching me. I want them to see when I finish my life, I won't be freaking out on my last day. I'll be saying to them, it's all right. I'm peaceful. I'm going to be with my Savior. That's how Jesus was able to die on the cross and say, it is finished. I think I told you my mom's last words. I was leaving her. I had to go preach. She was very near death. And I said, Mom, I'm going to go. I got to preach. I'll probably be back in a week to see you because she's in the Carolinas. And, and I said, do you have anything you want to say to me? Anything else you want to say? And all she said was, I'm done. I've done all I can do for the Lord, and I'm done. Awesome. And I say to you today, live in such a way that if it finishes up for you next week, you go, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> That's my last three phrases. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Peaceful. Jesus had peace. I want to tell y'all, I, I, I hope y'all are not missing this. The world does not have peace. We should. We should. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. And he finishes with, I am the life. Of course. If you discover the way to live through this and you know the truth as your truth, you seek it in Jesus and you continue to follow it, then that's the life. And you take that next step into the life. And, and, and let me just say something about that. If today you sense a peace and a guidance in your life, as I've done with parents this week, had two parents this week just freaking out. Should I send my kids to school or not? Come the fall, and I said to them, stop asking in post. Stop asking all your friends what they're doing. That's fine. Do all that. But first, go ask Jesus for the way to handle this. Both of them said to me, I did that, 
and I know what I'm going to do this fall. And I said, are you peaceful with it? Crazy peaceful. No matter what other people say, you're going to stick with that? Yeah, I'm, I've made my decision. I'm good. That's what Jesus gives. Now watch this. You go make that decision and it doesn't work out perfect. It's still okay. So often we go, well, if I follow the way of Jesus, I won't have any problems, right? Are you kidding me? Sometimes he gets you to step in the mess. You step in and you go, Jesus, you know I stepped in a pile of crap. Correct. <laughs> I put it there for you. <laughs> Not what we would want. But that pile of crap draws you closer to Jesus. That's a weird phrase. <laughs> I invite you today. See him as the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, I can live in the middle of this and just be good. And he said, the greatest thing we can do on this earth, love the Lord your God, Jesus' words, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, Jesus' words. Secondly, love your neighbor as yourself. You know who your neighbor is? <clears throat> do you know who your neighbor is? All races, all creeds, all colors. You need to understand Jesus said you need to leave here and you need to love everyone. Well, I don't like. <laughs> so you got to start with that right away with me, don't you? If you're feeling yourself getting defensive right there, I think the Spirit's talking to you about laying that down. Jesus loved us all. You got a choice what you're going to do with this message. I, I was talking to my daughter, her name's Christina. My youngest daughter's in the back with grandson uh, here, but she has three kids. Um, Chrissy and Brandon have three children, and their oldest, his name is Jackson. I've mentioned Jackson before. Jackson is seven. And so a while back, Chrissy was at the house. She just popped in for something, and she was telling me, ah, Jackson's been a little disrespectful lately. If you have a seven-year-old, you get it. It's just part of it. You know, it's just what kids are like, et cetera. I said, oh, you know what? When you get home and stuff, I'll FaceTime later. I want to talk to him. She said, okay. So later that evening, after dinner, I just FaceTimed and talked to her for a minute. And then I said, hey, Jackson, get on the line. So I'll get him, say hi to his sister and all that stuff. And then, and then I said, Jackson, I need to talk to you a little bit. So we talked about Pokemon cards. You know, I was doing the set him up. So we did a little Pokemon talk and all that stuff. And I said, now, Jackson, I need to talk to you about something. This is a little more serious. He said, okay. And he's talking to me. Okay, no problem. And I said, I want to talk to you about your behavior lately at home. Well, he sat there for the next, say I talked two minutes, probably two minutes. I, I just talk, me talk, and I can talk, obviously. And so I just keep talking. And he, he is not saying anything, but he's going, doing that so about two minutes into this Chrissy my daughter walks in the room and she grabs the iPad she goes dad how long you been talking to Jackson I said well I've been talking about his behavior here for about two last two or three minutes she said well just so you know he got you muted <laughs> he hasn't heard anything that you said so that whole time I'm talking he's doing this he do not know a thing I'm saying doesn't that sound like us doesn't that sound like us? Jesus is talking into our spirit today. <laughs> and you're muted. Because you know you'll have to leave and do something different. A little splash of him makes you go, but I wouldn't be able to. <laughs> oh, you mean you actually have peace? Oh, you mean you might have a shot at freeing up your soul oh you mean you might love someone a different way oh you mean you might build a relationship with someone who doesn't look like you a splash of Jesus go a long way at helping you go the right direction I'm done talking but I don't think the spirit's done moving If the Lord's spoken to you today about something in your life, some place of peace, some little splash of him you need, some way you need to reconcile with those who maybe don't look like you, I don't know. 
would you do me a favor? Would you honor him? Nothing to do with me. Everybody bow your heads and close your eyes a second. If the Lord's spoken to you today, will you stand up? You just, you pick it, your issue. Not, nothing to do with me. If the Lord spoke to you about something while I was preaching, will you stand up? I'm going to wait a second. God, here we stand, recognizing our need for you. Some are standing with fear. Some are standing with frustration. Some are standing with need for racial reconciliation. We all stand for different reasons, but the cool thing is we stand up to the one who stood for us first and now will help us grow toward him. Breathe on us, breath of God. Breathe newness into our souls. Help us to walk in the way that you want us to walk. Help us to follow truth. Help us to show life. Those who have stood, meet them at the very point of their need this morning and call them deeper in you. Would all of you join me in standing now? Everybody stand together. We're going to close with a song of worship, just giving it all to Jesus. Can I invite you to do that in your spirit? As you worship from kids to grandmas and grandpas, let's just invite Jesus to use our lives.
blessings of God over you, speaking his favor over your life. If you have a prayer need, head to the back. We've got a prayer team who would love to help you out. We'll see you next week.